have any heart. That's no, true. they suck. Person, I've been telling you all season, they Philly. Shit on you. Oh. They've shit on you. <laughs> Don't you hear me, Jordan Davis, <laughs> Caleb Carter? It's like they shit on you. Oh. They've shit on you. <laughs> They have shit on you. Don't don't you hear me, Jordan Davis, <laughs> Caleb Carter? It's like they shit on you. Kill them. Oh my goodness! Did he say they they cock it on them? I hate the style of defense. I oh my goodness! Well, good morning, good people. Ah. Uh, Mark Holmes here with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo, and he's got his morning cup of coffee as well. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. It's finally freaking Friday, and I couldn't be any happier than I am right now. We are going into the weekend. It's going to be in the 50s today. It's going to hit 62 tomorrow before it starts raining. And then, of course, on Sunday, we have the Dallas Cowboys going against the Philadelphia Eagles. It doesn't get any better than this, people. It does not get any better than this. So, <clears throat> this is it. This is the game. I'm going to call it the MVP earn respect game because the Cowboys are always always disrespected nobody ever gives the cowboys any credit you know typically when you know they, they look at teams and players and they talk about how great a quarterback's record is and things and i think they put too much stock in the record win loss record and being the quarterback it's a team game you can't put it all on one guy now an ass ass quarterback can lose you tons and tons of games but when it comes to the Cowboys and the Cowboys having a great record, especially in their division, they poo-poo it, just say, well, their division just sucks. Well, typically, you usually don't have more than like two good teams in a division. If you think about the New England Patriots for years, everybody in their division was pretty much under 500. They had six give-me games pretty much every year. All they had to do was win another five of their 10, go 500, and they've got 11 wins. And that makes a difference. Now, for our division, yes, the Giants and uh, the Commanders, they're not good this year. But I will say the Commanders have played great football against the Eagles, scoring 31 points and taking them to overtime. The Eagles, they are the defending NFC champions. They do have the best record in football. But they have been literally on the razor's edge of winning and losing every week. I'm not saying they're not a great team because they are. But... This is not as easy as it was for them last year. People want to give you their best shot. People want to knock you off. You've played more games than anybody else. Your bodies are still a little bit, you know, behind. And now you've got to play on the road. Now, the Eagles, they've been fortunate. You know, the Eagles are crying this week about lack of calls. Um, go back and look at, there's a video out there about the 49 calls. 49 calls on the Eagles going against the Cowboys. You'll remember, everybody talks about how they were just six inches short of the end zone. Yeah, but most people don't focus on the fact that he was being tackled before the ball ever got there. Now, the NFL, I guess, has tried to even out the field, ending up putting in the... Uh, Official, um, I can't think of his name at this moment, who literally has had six calls in, in, in seven games that he's had, six calls um, against the Eagles. And um, I want to say, what is his name? What is his name? Oh, my goodness. Um, 21 against everybody else. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it's not... Uh, you know, it's basically saying three penalty calls towards the other team if you go out of the numbers, and one against the Eagles, basically how it works out. It is uh, John Husley, Husley. So you kind of look at that and say, when you hear 21 to 6, you kind of, whoa, okay, that wasn't one game, that was actually seven games. So that equates to three penalties versus one, roughly, for the Eagles. Um, but... You have to figure that you're not going to get any quarter. But maybe, just maybe, 
because it's out there that the NFL will be looking a little bit harder because I think with the if you end up having a one-sided and it's blatantly one-sided officiated game, um, everybody's looking for it. And so this is where it may end up being the best thing that happened, actually having a guy who is deemed, boom. The NFL says, okay, we got a credibility problem. We need you to make sure that it's even on both sides of the ball. That way we can squash the whole thing. That, that's my thought on the process. But we'll have to wait and see how that goes. For the Cowboys, the much maligned Dak Prescott, who has had ownership, he has been pretty much the daddy of the NFC East. If you look at the numbers that Dak Prescott has put up in his career against the Eagles, uh, eight and four, eight and four, where he has put up, let me go through and look at this because I want to make sure I get the exact numbers on there. He has put up 22 TDs with eight interceptions, 100.7 rating, 67.3 completion percent. Dudes, that's freaking insane. It gets even better because when you actually look at the numbers and go a little bit deeper, when you think about his first couple of games against the Eagles, first game he had two TDs and the next two, he had zero TDs and had four interceptions the first three games. It looks a whole lot better. In fact, let's break it down to the last four games that he's played against the Eagles where the Cowboys have gone three and one 14 TDs one interception 313 yards 9.62 yard average 75.4 completion percentage and a 133.65 rating if Dak Prescott can do that at home against the Eagles you got a damn good shot to win now, the Eagles, they're going to be fired up. They end up, end up looking now and saying, somebody stole something. Or as A.J. Brown said, you know, it's like somebody's trying to take something off your plate. They understand the ramifications of this game. If you win this game, all you got to do is stay one game ahead of San Francisco. You got home field advantage. And it'll give you an extra week of rest and only two games to get to the Super Bowl. You lose this game, then that means you got a ball out every single week. And you won't get the opportunity to rest some of your players. And you will play that first game, which means it's three games. And you may have to go to San Francisco to play. So for the Eagles, it's everything. Now the Cowboys, I'm not going to say that it's not important to us because it is important to us. We'd like to have that NFC East ownership. We'd like to go ahead and keep that streak alive of no repeat champions, NFC East. And we would love to be able to earn some respect because in the end, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't matter who we beat. There's always a reason behind why that team lost to the Cowboys. Going into the Seattle game, it was the Cowboys haven't beat a team with a winning record, even though they did with the Jets the first week. Um... And then, of course, after the Cowboys beat Seattle, well, now they're a 500 team and they're not that good. Watch them go in and beat San Francisco this weekend, and then we'll see. Well, you know, because desperation in the NFL is a key thing. It is real. And this is one of those times where, you know, they may end up being, this is do or die for our season. So my key on this game is we got to keep Jalen Hurts in the pocket. We cannot allow him to run. He's not been effective running the football, and we need to be able to stop the run. Just like the Eagle fans yesterday that had to sign up, run the damn ball, well, that's going to be a key for this game. If the Cowboys can get out early, get a lead, and stop their run, I think we can get a great, great victory at home and set the tone for the rest of the season. Let's go to NFL Live and Swagoo and crew because they have some interesting takes on this game before I get ready to get to work. This is where the real football begins. Ooh, some enormous matchups this week as week 14 starts tonight. Welcome to NFL Live. We're going to pick 
Steelers and Patriots a little bit later on. Dan Orlovsky is here. Marcus Spears is there. Ryan Clark as well. And Adam Tucker is going to join us with all the news that you need to know. Guys, let's begin with that NFC East clash that has huge implications on Sunday. The Eagles and the Cowboys, what I'm talking about. Look at this. Eagles fans outside the facility there in Philly with the run the ball sign, okay, campaigning. Marcus, I don't know if you planted that sign there, but anyway, Nick Sirianni <laughs> saw it and acknowledged it. We gave him coffee. <laughs> uh, no, hey, I love our fans. I love their, their passion and their, their energy. That's not the first time I've heard around the ball. And you know what? And we do need to continue to try to run the ball. I'm not surprised by, by that. And I, and I appreciate their, their energy because I know that same energy of those guys sitting out there this morning when I drove in. They're going to have that same energy when they're, when they're cheering us on in the stadium. And I'm thankful and grateful for that. I wonder if they put like cream in the coffee or anyway. All right. Hopefully. I know, right? <laughs> hey, those fans may be on to something, by the way, because in their last seven games, the Eagles have not run the ball as often or as effectively as they did to start the season. They're averaging nearly 10 fewer rush attempts per game than they were through their first five games and are bottom 10 in rush yards per game and yards per rush. Philly had only 46 rushing yards in last week's loss against the 49ers, their fewest in any game started by Jalen Hurts. RC, you think the Eagles should be leaning on the run game more in their matchup this week against Dallas? Heck yeah. Listen, I played in the NFC East, and all I would ever hear in Maryland, Virginia, the DMV, was those stupid Philly fans. Lies you tell because those two fans standing <laughs> outside of the facility are absolute geniuses. They have to run the football. If you look at the last two games, they start with straight drop back passing, and it was very similar in the game against Kansas City. But in Kansas City and also Buffalo, we watched them be a little innovative. Here you see a pony personnel. We have the DeAndre Swift lined up at the number one receiver off the football and they got into the jet sweep. When you can do some of those things, that's when you open up things for Jalen Hurts and this passing attack. Just sitting back there and thinking that you're going to pick defenses apart from the middle of the pocket is not playing to Jalen Hurts' or the Philadelphia Eagles strength. And it's like during the week, offensive coordinator Brian Johnson somehow forgets who they are. Yeah. They're a team that are that is physical, that can run the ball, and then get into the the past game. Marcus and I saw Jordan Mulata in the pregame against the Kansas City Chiefs, and the man looks like, not that he was chiseled out the side of a mountain, he is the whole Mickey <laughs> Ficky mountain. So him, Jason Kelsey, and Lane, and Lane Johnson coming downhill yes, is what hey. you want. You start that way and get into the pass game. Mm. RC, well, I, it's good to see you, my brother. I'm glad America has come around. <laughs> Okay, I even got Dan talking about running the damn oh, football. Boy. I never thought in a million years <laughs> we would get to this point. But it's but but it's what we've been talking about during the I'm week. It's identity, man. And 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 it's effective even even if you average in 2.9 or you you're not running the ball as effectively as you want to, you just planting seeds. And I, we used to always look at it like this, because y'all know we played in a time when it was gonna be a minimum of 30 runs in a game if yeah. teams could. And you continue yep. to plant them seeds, and then you look for the home run ball. And I think that's what makes Philly different. Look, I'm going to say this, too. For as much love that we've given San Francisco this week, I believe that this Philly game, that, that game against – I think that's an anomaly. Hmm. I'm not going to attach against the 49ers. to who the Philadelphia mm -hmm. Eagles yeah. are based on all that we've watched them do. For Philly to win this game, they have to do what they do best against Dallas. And it means that Micah Parsons does not get a third down sack. He doesn't have a third down sack against the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles. And that's because Philadelphia takes number 11, the Lion, out of the game. Three different ways. Number one, this is why partly Dallas Goddard coming back matters. This is their first game of the year against each other where they motion him down. Both of these tight ends are going to put their hands all over Micah. They are not going to just single block him in the run game. There's that double team. Philadelphia will not allow him on early downs to destroy their run game. Number two, when he gets a blow, when he's off the field, they take their shot. They want to be way more aggressive. Michael Parsons is not on the field here. What do they do? They throw the football down the field, and they go and score on a deep touchdown pass down the left sideline. Number three, they put him in conflict. They're out of respect. We cannot block you, so we're not going to try. This is the great job of understanding we're not going to block him. We're going to put him in conflict, meaning he's got to make a decision. Is Jalen Hurts going to carry it? Is he going to kick the RPO bottom, bubble at the bottom? Is he going to throw one-on-one -on -one up top, or is he going to hand it off? 
and it gets him to play a little bit slower. Again, Micah doesn't have a third down sack when he plays the Philadelphia Eagles. So for Philly to win this game, and this is why I've always felt the that third Dallas down sack. So that's where we're at now. matters the most is they take number 11 out of the game. Now, Demarcus Lawrence has been awesome this year. If he has a huge game because Micah is, had so much attention to him, that is a huge advantage for Dallas. But I think Philadelphia is equipped with Goddard back to make sure Micah doesn't ruin the game. Okay. I have a thing. Because yeah. Dan, you make a, a great point. I have a thing. And, and I know people are going to lose their damn mind because we think about Micah <coughs> coming off the edge. This is middle the game linebacker. where you play him at middle linebacker. Mm. This is the game where you don't mm. give an offensive line a beat you on think? him and allow him to be in different spots and change. Hell yes, Dio. Listen, and, and the reason being is because Has when he? he's off the line of script. Go ahead. Go ahead, RC. No, no, no. no I, I was going to ask you a question. I was going to ask you. When yep. and you were starting to talk about it a little bit, I think they should move him around. Not I necessarily agree. that he shouldn't ever get an opportunity to rush because there are going to be those obvious pass downs. Mm -hmm. But for one time, if you're Dan Quinn, this is where you move him off the football. You move him over the guard. Yeah. You have him at the defensive end. It should be a where's Micah sort of game That's for right. Dan where's Quinn Waldo? and the Dallas Cowboys so they can't pinpoint where he is to game plan it. This is this is why this is why we're all best friends and we work together and we talk about these games and we see a picture. And literally, I was about to say before you said that, RC, line him up in the middle and let him end up wherever you want him to. Okay. Just don't give this mm -hmm. defense the ability to know where he's going to be. It doesn't matter. It don't matter if he start in the middle of the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. And I've seen Cleveland do this with Miles Garrett. Mm -hmm. You can end up at end, yep. but make the blocking scheme account for him, and then you can move a position. It's almost like disguising from the linebacker to D line position yeah. as opposed yeah. to it being the secondary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the very least, it should allow him to get more pressures. He has two or fewer pressures in three of his four career games against the Eagles. So there you go. Maybe that's the recipe for doing it. They know where he well, you know, that's the case of the Eagles saying that Lane Johnson is his daddy. I think you definitely have to move him around to uh, get more pressures in there. Keep the Eagles on their toes, excuse me, on their heels, um, trying to figure out where he is every single play. Let's be clear here. This is it. This is the game. This is for the MVP. This is for the division. This is all of it. This is everything that you could want. And to be Sunday night, it's going to be anticipation all day long. I'm Mark Holmes, and I appreciate each and every one of you guys. And I will hopefully see you real, real soon. Eagles look. I'm still going to have a good week. As long as the Eagles lose, I'm still going to have a good week. Everybody loses, I'm still having a good week. Because we still in it by one game. God damn it. Jason fucking Garrett. Seriously? Is that what y'all went through for 10 years? Is that what y'all went through for 10 years? Exactly. But we actually had a good team. What? Oh, now you, you want to see, see the shit now. When he with y'all. Well, we be dealing with it all this damn time. How do you fucking call he plays? Said you how to do it. How in the fuck? I don't get this. No, but Jason Garrett. Seriously, Jason Garrett. How do you fucking Mark call plays? Like he was over there trash. I'm over here. Oh, uh, in a oh long time. Oh my god. Really oh my god. god. I don't, I don't believe this right action. now. Everybody's right now. How do, you feel, how do you feel about the team, my no, shit? Oh my God, like, it's Jason Gertz! <laughs> it's Jason Gertz's fault! Like y'all been saying for 10 years. Jason Gertz! Oh how in the fuck now you call, you, uh, you how do you right? call on fourth, fifth, uh, third and 15, you call a five yard play. Then the next play, you go down, you call up a 20 yard play, wow. they get the first down. Then you put Danny Dimes in position to throw a fucking interception. Seriously? Run the goddamn ball or something to get the field. So I, oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to hell home. I'm going to hell home. We all go. You all lost. So don't get mad. Don't y'all can y'all can get pride in my jewel and my anger, but y'all lost too. Fuck y'all. Damn it. Shit. Fuck. Let's go home.
How in the hell the last four games, the last four games now, oh, three, three out of four, you're driving down the field near the end zone and you throw a goddamn interception every goddamn time. What the oh, hell is that? We got, got all that time. Yeah, yeah, now you see the shit. What the hell is that? <laughs> What the hell? You call it payback is a mofo. <laughs> How do you do an interception payback. every goddamn time? Payback? How do you, exactly. How did we get Eli to the Eli Manda 2.0. Eli Manda 2.0. Jason Garrett 2.0. <laughs> what yeah, the bleep? What the bloody hell? You do an interception every... Oh, my God. What? Oh, didn't I just say that about us? Now y'all... Now you're reaping, reaping our... Back in the day benefits, I guess.